Folks, that's what we do with faith sometimes. We tell God what we're going to go do, and we want Him to bless it. Instead of finding out, Lord, what do you want? God, what's important to you? Because, see, I want this thing. See, I even have to check my own heart. Lord, what's my agenda? Because if you've been believing God for something for a long time and you haven't seen the manifestation of it, there's a couple of things that could be wrong. Wasn't that powerful? And it's so lined up perfectly with what I was going to talk about this morning. Um, we're just talking about faith, you know, what it is and what it's not. You know, if anybody ever tells you that faith is this force field that goes around you, that keeps you from all unpleasant things, that it's the, uh, it will ever, you'll never get hurt, you'll never be confused, you'll never be perplexed. If anybody tries to tell you that faith is the end-all, be-all, then they're lying to you. Faith is messy. I want to be real honest with you. If you're believing God for something, it is messy. Now, I know women may get offended when men talk about women having babies, but I'm going to talk about women having babies for a minute, okay? No, I've never had one before. But I've been in the room when all three of mine were born. And it was messy. Amen? That is your faith in action. What you are believing God for, it can sometimes be messy. Because you are birthing something, you are believing God for something, and it's not this beautiful, sterile, little perfect little cupcake that God gives you and pats you on your head and say, congratulations, you did a really, really good job. No, you're going to get in there and you're going to fight for what you're believing for. And if you're not giving 100% for what you're believing for, you're never going to get it. If you're not willing to give 100% for what you're believing for, then you're never going to get it. That's faith. Amen? 2 Timothy 1.5. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. It says, I am calling up memories of your sincere and unqualified faith. The leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ and absolute trust and confidence in his power, in his wisdom, and in his goodness. Folks, that is one of the greatest biblical examples of the faith that we're supposed to be walking in. I'm going to read that again. The leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ in absolute trust and confidence in His power, in His wisdom, and in His goodness. That is being 100% sold out for what you're believing for. I have, every time that I have believed God 100%, I have received everything I've ever asked for. But how many times did I ask God for something and I only gave 50% or 10% or 5% and I sat there and I got mad or frustrated or disappointed because I didn't get what I'd asked him for? Did I go all in? Now I'll give you a secret about what happened with Steve and Barbara. Steve and Barbara, see Steve, this is his third kidney. This is Steve's third kidney. And he, his last one was nine years ago. And so for nine years, Steve has been wanting this new kidney. If I can only get this kidney, my life will get better. If I can only get this kidney, and he even told us in the hospital Friday night, he said, you know what, Pastor? I kind of made an idol out of it. I started looking at this kidney and almost coveting it or, or idolizing it, just thinking, if I could just get this kidney, everything else is going to be all right. And the minute him and Barbara put that aside and they put God first place and they said, God, we're going to give you 100 percent. See, here's the here's the bottom line about faith. 
we are trying to get God involved in what we're doing. And when they put that down and got involved in what God was doing, the kidney showed up the next day. And so I want each and every one of us this morning to reevaluate, what do we believe in God for? What is my faith project? What am I believing God for right now in my life? And is it something that I'm trying to get God involved in for me? Or am I willing to die to this thing and say, God, I am now going to take all of that effort and all that energy and I'm going to put it into what's important to you? Because the minute we get involved with what God's doing, the faith's there to do it. It wasn't Noah's idea to build the ark. It wasn't Noah's idea to build the ark. Noah didn't say, Lord, I've got this great idea. I am going to get these seeds and I am going to plant these trees and I am going to take care of these trees till they get to the point where they can be harvested and turn into lumber, Lord. And then I am going to build this boat and then I am going to go find all these animals and then I am going to shut it up. Folks, that's what we do with faith sometimes. We tell God what we're going to go do and we want him to bless it. Instead of finding out, Lord... What do you want? God, what's important to you? Because see, I want this thing. See, I even have to check my own heart. Lord, what's my agenda? Because if you've been believing God for something for a long time and you haven't seen the manifestation of it, there's a couple of things that could be wrong. Number one, is it just the desire of my heart for this thing? Or Lord, how does it fit into your will in the big picture of life? Now, healing goes without saying. Amen? It's God's will that you be healed in every part of your body, body, soul, and spirit. So we're not waiting on a healing from God. Amen? Amen? But I am saying, Lord, I'm believing you, Lord, for a new house. But why, am I believing you for a new house for the right reasons? Is this house going to bring glory to you when people come to it? Lord, I'm believing you for more money. Is that so I can watch more television? I can buy that boat and quit coming to church on Sundays? Come on. God knows our hearts, folks. You think we're hiding something from him? Do you think there's a place in your house that you can go where he doesn't know what's going on inside of us? He knows exactly where you are right now. He knows and he loves us anyway. God loves you just the way that you are and too much to let you stay that way. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord. What was the last step you took towards the thing that you're believing for? Because that's a very important question when we come to faith. What was the last step you took towards the thing that you're believing for? Do you remember? See, there are steps of faith. The alarms, uh, when was it, two, when did the alarms go off real bad here? Last Sunday morning. Last Sunday morning, yeah. I get up Sunday morning at 6 o'clock. I'm going to do my private time, my reading time. I was going to do the youth that morning, and I was really going to take advantage of my 6 o'clock in the morning time to kind of prepare for that. And as I'm reading, as I'm preparing, the minute I sit down, I get one verse and my phone rings. I know exactly who it is. It's the alarm company. Dear Mr. Pigeon, your fire alarms are going off, all your sensors are going off, the fire department has already been dispatched, anything you'd like to do, no, I'm on my way. So it was kind of funny, I ran into the room, Michelle was starting to get up and get ready to go, I put on a sweatshirt and I just had on my boxers and I walked out the door, <laughs> and she thought I'd gone to the church like that, but I had pants in the other room. So I came up to the church and I knew exactly what had happened. The heaters came on for the first time. Whenever that happens, there's dirt and stuff on the coil. All of these air conditioners have what are called duct detectors on them. So when they came on for the first time, it burnt the dirt that was on the coils causing the fire alarm to go off. I know that because I've done these steps many, many times. 
See, remember that day in Bible school where they teach you about ACs and sound systems and all that? No, no. There are steps, to my knowledge, for this building. So I walked out the steps that I knew to do. I checked every duct detector in here. And I finally got to back here. I looked up, got into the roof, and saw the sensor that was going off. Hallelujah. I took the steps as far as I could take them. Got a ladder, got up in there, but it turns out the duct detector is way up there. I took my steps as far as I could take them to that point. Then I had to call for help, which they'll come if you pay the money. They will come and help you every single time. So a man came, he got a ladder, he disappeared up into the roof. He took a step that I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to take. Amen? And he fixed it for us. But all of a sudden, I started thinking about our faith. Faith is a step. And sometimes we are trying to get to the end of the process before we've done some of the steps that are in the middle. See, Steve wasn't ready for that kidney. Steve wasn't ready. You have to take care of a kidney. You know what we're going to do as a body? We're going to make Steve eat vegetables. Amen? Steve is a new vegetarian. Amen? <laughs> we'll leave her out of it. Getting Steve to eat something green is like pulling teeth. But we're going to, we're going to get, she's going to take care of this kidney. But you know what? Steve had not taken the steps necessary to be ready to receive that kidney. And sometimes we are trying to hurry up the steps to get to the thing that we're believing for and if God were to give that thing to you, you have not developed the endurance or what it's going to take to hold on to the thing that you're believing for. And so that's where the steps, see, even in Romans, what we're going to talk about, God gave Abraham the steps of faith. But we all have to recognize and realize, Lord, where am I in the process? There are steps to what you're believing for. Now, here's a, here's a common misconception about faith. Faith is not us going around asking people to pray for us for the thing that we're believing for. That's not faith. Emily did not come home for Thanksgiving this year because she's got a series of finals and tests that she's about to take. Amen? So Emily's about to take a test. Biology, chemistry, all those things that I was really, really good in as a young man. She got it all from me. The chemistry maybe from the 80s, but no, all the other stuff, I don't know. You'll get that on the way home. Anyway, Emily is not going from room to room asking people to pray for her about the test she's about to take. She's not getting the whole school to agree with her for these tests. What do you have to do for a test? You have to study. And that's sometimes where we miss it when it comes to believing God for things. Is that we think in the multitude of prayer or worship or service that we're going to receive what we're believing for. But in reality, you have to study for the test. Because the secret of faith is, is that it's not what you're believing for that's the best part of faith. It's all that you learned in between in the steps on how you got there. Because beginning the believing for the kidney is not the end of the faith story. Now all the faith that they've used for those nine years, they're going to use again in keeping the kidney, in taking care of the kidney. The faith that you use when your child is getting straddled by someone, getting ready to stick a tube down their throat, is the same faith you're going to use when you get a bad report. See, we're, we're trying to learn to believe God for faith for cancer, and we've never learned how to use it for a headache. We think all of a sudden that your faith is going to kick in when something horrendous happens, and we're not using it in our day-to-day -day life. You know, I did a powerlifting competition not too long ago, and I did not wait till I got to the contest to start lifting weights. There were some that did. 
It sure looked like it. It really, really did. No, that weight was there to try me. And what we're going to test was, was how much did you train in order to be able to lift that weight? Because the weight, there's nothing to the weight. The weight's the weight for everybody. That weight doesn't have a personality. That weight is just a weight. Everything was dependent on me. And did I prepare myself? Did I take the right steps to prepare myself so that I could lift that off the ground multiple times? That's life. Life is a weight. What you're believing for is a weight. Well, why isn't it coming off the ground, Pastor Jack? Have you trained to the point where you can lift it off the ground? Don't try and lift up a thousand pounds if you've never lift up five. It'll kill you. It will. I watched a guy at that meet bench for, or, or, well, Guys benched over five and six hundred pounds. People were deadlifting seven, eight hundred pounds. Just massive amounts of weight. The higher you get into the things, the better your form and the better your technique has to be. You can just walk over and pick something up sometimes. But if you're going to get into the heavier and higher things, you have to do it right. That's faith. If we're going to get up and we're going to believe God for big things, if we're going to believe God for nations, if we're going to believe God for the lost, we're not just going to walk in the gym that first day, pick up a couple of things and think, whoop, I'm in shape now. I'm ready. No, no, we got to train. That's why we come to church. We train, we train, we train, we listen, we're discipled, we're disciplined. We take what's, and we listen to it, and we apply it in our lives, and we use it, and we use it, and we use it, and we, we live a transparent life before God, and we cut out the things that we know are going to hurt us, and we add the things that we know are going to help us, and we give 100%, 100% to God. I dare you. I double-dog dare you. To give God 100%. In every area of your life. In your marriage, to your kids, in your business, in your church. And the Lord would say, try me now in this. If I'll not open for you the windows of heaven. And pour you out such a blessing. That there's not room enough to receive it. Folks, we all have faith. Each one of us was given the measure of faith. Amen? Each and every one of us, God has put inside of us that faith, and it's like a muscle, and all we have to do is begin to use it. What we'll do sometimes is that we would rather live off a lower level with less, but not have to do more work and be satisfied instead of being willing to do what it takes to step up and do more. Am I right? I mean, we can learn your body. The way God created our body is that if you live off of 2,000 calories a day, if you were to cut that to 1,500 calories a day, yes, you're going to lose weight, but you're going to come to a point where you stop losing weight. Why is that? Because God created your body to adapt to whatever there is, whatever food that you're taking in so that you won't die. It's the same thing with our faith. Your body's going to get used to whatever you teach it and whatever, however you train it. That's why we have to constantly be changing it up. Amen? That's why it's so important for us to meditate on the Word. That's why it's so important for us to speak the Word. That's why it's so important for us to be into Bible study. See, that's what our church is all about. We're a Bible-teaching, discipleship church. This is what we know. This is what we do. Amen? Yes, are there some areas we could be better in? Sure. But our number one focus is we do leadership training here. If you will come, I would say for a minimum of six months, and apply yourself and listen and take notes and act on what you're taught, your life will change dramatically. It will change dramatically. You, you don't need to come in for counseling. You don't. There are certain times where people need to come in and talk to you, and that's great. But for the most part, 
if people are dealing with issues in your life, if you'll come for six months and give 100%, you won't ever have to, God will answer you from the pulpit. It won't cost you a dime. Isn't that awesome? You won't have to take any time off of work. You're already here on a Sunday morning or on a Tuesday night. Amen? Romans chapter 4, out of the message. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and I'm going to read this. It's out of the message translation, so it's going to sound a little different. I told Barbara at the hospital Friday night, I said, Barbara, would you preach Sunday morning? I'll sing the offertory, you preach. Aren't you glad she sang the offertory? I said, that was so powerful. She was preaching to us. It says, if Abraham, by what he did for God, got God to approve him, he could have certainly taken credit for it. But the story we are given is a God story, not an Abraham story. This is the message out of Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. The turning point in Abraham's life is when he entered into what God was doing for him. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. Whew! Anybody deal with the works mentality? You feel like you have to keep doing for God or you won't get blessed? Do you feel like the more you do for God, the more busy things you do for God, the more he loves you, and the less you do for him, the less that he loves you? Come on. It's a works complex. We all deal with it sometimes. That's not faith, though, is it? You know, if Abraham had to do everything that God asked him to do by works in order to get God to love him, then that was the law, and it was done by works. But what Abraham did for God was he just got involved with what God was doing and did what God told him to do when he told him to do it. And the Bible says that it was accounted to him for righteousness. See, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Jack believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I believed God and it was accounted to me for righteousness. Each and every one of us needs to make that personal in our lives. I believe God. You know what that's a picture of? Salvation. You believe God, and it was accounted for you for righteousness, right standing with God. All you had to do was believe. Say, just believe. Just believe. All things are possible to him that believeth. All things, say all. all. All things are possible to him that believeth. See, God's got everything already done. All he's doing is he's looking for one person that's willing to get in there and believe him for what he's already promised. Amen. You don't have to go reinvent the wheel. You don't. All you've got to do is believe for what he's already done. God doesn't have to go build a new bank in order for you to get money. The money's already here. All you've got to do is know how to believe him for it. And then ask yourself, why am I believing you for this money? That's the key. That's biblical prosperity. Lord, what is the purpose? Lord, I'm believing you for a million dollars, okay? What's your plan? Well, Lord, uh, I'm going to buy my mom a new house. I'm going to get a new car. And, and those are good. those are good things, but... Think about what's our motive when we're believing God for certain things. Amen? Believing for the lost. Every one of us have lost people in our lives. Yes or no? Yeah. Amen. We can use that. Is it God's will for all men to be saved? Yes or no? Yeah. So that's already, there's already something there for us to believe. Well, Lord, if it's your will, then all I got to do is just believe. Amen? Do a little spiritual warfare. Pray in tongues over that person and then you go have the talk with them. You'd be surprised. I think we would all be very, very surprised for that person that we've been praying for. If we would just go have the talk with them, they'd get saved. Because they're ready. Amen? Because they're ready. A little bit more. We doing okay? No turkey comas going on here? Everybody's good? Turkey comas. 
I'll finish with this. Faith is your servant. Faith is your servant. Go to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, uh, we'll beginning in verse 3. Take heed for yourselves. If thy brother trespasses against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turning into thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. How funny. They said, oh my gosh, if i got to keep forgiving these people over and over and over and over and over, Lord, I need my faith for that. This is going to be hard. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would go ask for help. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd call the prayer line. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd sing. What would you do if you had faith like a mustard seed? You'd say. If you had faith as a mustard seed, you would say, faith is never silent. Faith is never silent. You have to be speaking to that thing that you're believing for. Amen? Barbara and Steve spoke to that kidney for nine years. Nine years to get that kidney. And you know what we prayed for Steve the first time when all this... See, she left out some of the... the messier parts of that testimony see when they have to get steve ready for a kidney surgery there's some pretty intense things they have to do to his body to prepare him for it some very violating things some very painful things and so when he woke up and he didn't feel the pain he was expecting and they're yanking all these tubes and things out of his body and he's like what's going on amen That'll test your faith. Amen? That'll test your faith. So faith is never silent. You have to speak. You have to speak. And when he called me that day, he was just devastated. Pastor, what happened? He called my dad. He didn't call me because he was hurting. He was like, man, I, I don't understand it. I'm hurting. I'm in pain, Lord. I don't know what to do. But the thing that rose up in us was, Steve, God just saved your life. Because had they put that kidney in you, You'd have died. You would have bled out. So even though that is not the route we have chosen, God saved your life, Steve, so that we can fight another day. And we pray, Lord, we don't just want the kidney. We want, we want the perfect kidney for your body. Steve, we don't just want some, some secondhand you know, might fit, might not. No, we want, we want a kidney so perfect it's as if your body it had been in your body the whole time. And you know what he got? Exactly that. It happened in Houston. This kidney did not have to be transported from one place to another. And it was the most perfect match. And you know what? All those doctors and nurses felt bad because, oh my gosh, Steve's back. This is the guy we just did wrong two weeks ago. We're going to take extra special care of Steve this trip around. You know what? And he got it. And he got the perfect kidney. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Does he think the servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, We are unprofitable servants, which you have done that which was our duty to do. In other words, faith is your servant. What we do sometimes is we act like the servant when it comes to faith. We go plow the fields. We go field the cows. We think we have to do all the works in order to make this thing happen that we're believing for. And God is like, why are you doing that? Faith is your servant. 
Faith, all it knows how to do is go get the thing that you're believing for. But it said, you're leaving faith at the table, and you're leaving the table, and you're trying to go do all the works to make this thing happen. And it's backwards. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, excuse me. As Jesus went into Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him and saying, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house paralyzed and distressed with intense pains. And Jesus said to him, I will come and restore him. But the centurion replied to him, Lord, I am not worthy or fit to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant boy will be cured. For I also am a man subject to authority with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled. And he said to those who followed him, I have not found so much faith as with anyone, even in Israel. The centurion understood and recognized that faith was Jesus' servant. So just as the centurion had servants that did exactly what the centurion told him to do, he recognized the authority in Jesus and he knew that faith was Jesus' servant and that that servant would do whatever Jesus told him to do. Say that faith Faith. is my servant. servant. What are you feeding your servant? What are we feeding our servant? There's only one diet that this bad boy will take. He does not work off McDonald's and Burger King. Amen? He only works off the Word of God. The only way that your servant, the only diet that he can take, we were in the, they brought Steve a menu for dinner that Friday night, and so He's on, he wanted solids, foods, you know, who wouldn't, right? But he's on this liquid diet. So the lady brought him a, a menu, and it was this trifold menu, but it had like four things on it. <laughs> it was blank, and it had like four things that he could have. Oh, this is the liquid diet. So he got chicken broth. <laughs> it was funny. It was like they got this whole trifold, and it has four things that you can get off of it for a liquid diet. It was pretty funny. But anyway, what are we feeding our servant? If we're not taking the Word of God and putting it into our hearts and meditating on it and speaking it and acting on it, then our servant is not strong enough to go out and do everything that we're asking it to do. You've got to feed. You've got to take care. Servants are like teeth. Just take care of the ones you want to keep. That's it. Right? If you had somebody that was working in your house and you wanted them to do a good job for you, would you take care of them? Or would you treat them like trash? You'd take care of them. You'd feed them. You would, you would, you would encourage them. You would bless them. You would pay them a good skill. See, faith, we, we're, we keep waiting for God to do something. And God is saying, your servant's just sitting there at the table with you. Send him to go get what you need. And he'll go do it for you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. Thank you for that one hand clap. That was powerful. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. What do you believe in God for this morning? Amen. Well, how do we know if I'm in faith or not? Do you have corresponding scriptures to what you're believing for? Do you know what those scriptures are right now if I were to ask you? What you're believing for. Can you quote those scriptures to me? Are they written down somewhere? Are you confessing them on a daily basis? Are you thanking the Lord for what you're believing for right now? Because we don't want to get off into this this thing of mental assent, thinking that we're believing God for something, but your servant's never left the house. See, we think he's been long gone out bringing that thing towards us of what we're believing for, but he's still sitting at the table drinking coffee. Why isn't it? Because we haven't told him where to go yet. Abraham found out that faith was the way to get from God. 
That's the great revelation. Abraham figured out it was faith is the process of how we receive from God. So it's the same thing for us this morning. Faith is the way that you're going to receive from God. There is no other way. There's no plan B. Faith is a 100% giving of our entire being and personality for what we're believing for. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. We plead the blood of Jesus over us, Lord, over this season. Lord, I thank you that this will be the greatest Christmas season that each person in this room has ever experienced. Father, I thank you for restoration in relationships. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for healing in families. I thank you, Lord, for healing in marriages. Father, I thank you that this is the time for lost children to come home. Father, I thank you, Lord, for favor, Lord, over all those that are about to take finals and test in school. I thank you, Lord, that our, our children and the people of our church, Lord, have the mind of Christ. And so, Father, I thank you that just like Daniel, we are ten times smarter than those that are around us. Father, I declare and just prophesy bonuses and raises over every person in this room. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for those that have given an honest day's work, that they're going to receive an honest day's wage and some. I thank you, Lord, for opportunities to increase. I thank you, Lord, that we're not going in debt for Christmas this year, Father. I thank you that you've, there's no such thing as a Black Friday to a believer. We don't have to go the world's ways to get the world's goods. Well, we can just believe you for it. You'll put me in the right place with the right money at the right time every single time in Jesus' name. Amen.